Okay, welcome back to part two of global warming. Uh, we're going to continue on here uh, talking about the objectives of this chapter, which is chapter nine. I'm going to continue talking a bit about basic principles and the scientific basis and evidence for climate change. In particular, I'm going to talk about ancient climate and how we know uh, what the climate of the earth was going back uh, well, hundreds of thousands of years. And of course, these would be uh, non-human effects. These were natural effects. And then we'll move on and talk about radiative forcing, which is the human impact on the climate. And I'll reiterate that this is probably the most critical issue of our time. So it's really um, a part of the course that I would urge you to pay particular attention to. It's going to be something you're going to have to you know, deal with probably over your entire life. So I'm going to start by reviewing some of the what's called nuclear chemistry, some very basic nuclear chemistry, which for people with some science background will uh, probably be a review. And the main thing we need to do this for is so that you can understand what an isotope is, because we know ancient uh, temperature. We have a record or we have a, a proxy measurement of the ancient uh temperature on Earth using isotopes of different elements. So I'm going to start, and I, I actually talked about this in class a little bit, just a little bit of a review of uh, the atom. So the atom has three uh, basic components, so three basic subatomic uh, parts. They're the protons uh, and neutrons in the nucleus. So we have a, a hard, dense nucleus consisting of protons that are at the core of the atom. They have a positive charge. The neutrons are also at the in the nucleus. They have no charge at all. And uh, there are electrons that uh, orbit around the center of the atom. Let me just change my pointer here to a, so I can point to things. Okay, we're back to the laser pointer. Okay, so we have this, this uh, nucleus here with the uh, neutrons and protons, and the electrons are in sort of an orbit around them. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the basic structure. By definition, protons and neutrons have an atomic mass unit of one here, and electrons are much, much lighter. They're about one two thousandth of the weight of an electron, of a proton or a neutron. And as I mentioned, protons have a charge of plus one, electrons have a charge of negative one. And this atom here is a lithium atom, you can tell, because it has three protons, and lithium is element number three. So atoms are always uh, charge neutral, so the number of protons and the number of electrons is the same. In this case, three uh, protons and three electrons. And the nucleus, it, I want to emphasize, is very small relative to the electron orbits. Let me just give you an example here. This is a uh, sort of a, a Toronto-ized example. So if you imagine an atom, a single atom in your body expanded till it was the size of the sky dome, I guess that's the Rogers Center now, uh, then the nucleus, which contains the neutrons and protons, would be a P at center field. So right at center field here, you'd have a little P that contained the protons and neutrons. And the electrons, which would be orbiting out here, out at the, the dome of the sky dome, uh, would be the like grains of the size of, of grains of sand. Uh, so it gives you a sense of the fact that matter all of the atoms that we're made of are mostly made of nothing. So matter is mostly the sort of a vacuum. And when you touch something, when you physically touch something, you're actually not touching it. It's the electron repulsions. The electrons have the same charge. They're both negative and they, they repel. And that's the, when you touch something, it's the electron repulsion that you're feeling. So that's a little reminder about the atom and its relative size. Okay, the standard way to represent uh, an element, I'm going to call it X. Here I have carbon with a 6 and a 12. You have a, a symbol here first. Uh, 
to represent the element, so C for carbon in this case, and up in the top corner here. And then there's a letter, Z, a number Z, uh, which is the atomic number, and a mass number A. And so here we have carbon with 6 and 12. So the atomic number, so the number here in the bottom left-hand side, Z, tells you the number of protons. Uh, and the number of protons in the element determines the element's chemical properties. We'll talk more about that later on. The number up here, this A, so in this case 12, tells you the number of protons and neutrons, so the total number of what are called nucleons in uh, the nucleus. And down below here, I've shown kind of scary, if you're, if you're not a science person, this is the periodic table of elements. So these are all of the elements on the planet. Uh, I've cut it off here. There's actually more than 103 now, but uh, I've cut. this is sort of a truncated version of the periodic table. Now, the key thing to recognize is element one is hydrogen. It has one proton. Element two is helium. It has two protons. Element three is lithium, three protons. Now you're getting it. So you're going up by one proton at a time. And so hydrogen is element one. Helium is element two, lithium is element three. So that's what the atomic number here is at the bottom. And I've left off the mass number. So if you count up all the way to six, so it's telling you carbon has six uh, uh, protons in its nucleus, it's element number six. Now we'll talk about this number up here. For the same element, the number up, the mass number can actually be different and still be the same element. So consider, uh, again, carbon here with a, its element number six. And this is a particular type of carbon called carbon-12. I'm going to represent that as C-12. It's still element number six. So it has, so the Z, uh, the atomic number is six, meaning it has six protons. But up here, we have 12. So it's telling us that the number of protons plus the number of neutrons must add up to uh, 12. Now, the strange thing is, is elements, so carbon can exist with six protons, but different numbers of neutrons. And the same element, such as carbon, uh, with different number of neutrons, but the same number of protons that determines the element, are called isotopes. Another naturally occurring version of uh, carbon is carbon-14. So it's always six, because that's the six protons tells you it's carbon, but it's possible to have a couple of extra uh, neutrons in the nucleus. So in this case, six protons plus eight neutrons gives the mass number of 14. And so that's another isotope of carbon. Has pretty much the same chemical properties as carbon, uh, but it's a little heavier. And there's lots of elements in fact, many, many of the elements come in different, maybe like flavors, different different weights. Uh, one is, for example, hydrogen. Hydrogen, standard hydrogen is, is, of course, all hydrogen has only one proton in its nucleus, but it could have either uh, uh, no neutrons, in that case, just one proton, so a mass number of one. It could have one neutron, so a mass number of two, or a couple of extra neutrons and have a mass number of three. These are all hydrogen, even though they have different names. Just colloquially, we refer to hydrogen with a mass of one as hydrogen. Deuterium is hydrogen with a, with a mass number of two. That's sort of heavy hydrogen. These are both naturally occurring, uh, innate, you know, they occur in, 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 in your glass of water has some hydrogen that has uh, an extra uh, neutron. And then in nuclear reactors, uh, we can sometimes create tritium. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the uh, uh, nu nuclear reactors later on in this, in this course. So isotopes are elements that have the same number of protons, because the protons determine what the element is, but different numbers of neutrons, so uh, different weights. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, the reason is because global temperature measurement, so prehistoric temperature measurement, can be done using what's called isotopic uh, 
measurement. So we can look at the isotopes in uh, ice cores and sea sediments and determine the ancient temperatures. So I'm going to tell you how that works. What we use is we use the isotopes of hydrogen and oxygen, which make up, of course, water. Uh, so the analysis is based on the stable isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen, which form water. And so it turns out that the natural abundance of, of oxygen, so the oxygen that you're breathing right now, 81 or 2% of the air that you're breathing right now is oxygen. Those oxygen atoms, 99.8% of them are oxygen 16. And then every once in a while, one in every 500 atoms there's an oxygen atom that has an extra couple of neutrons in its nucleus, and it's uh, oxygen-18. It's a little bit heavier. So there's a little bit of heavy oxygen that has a natural occurrence of about 0.2%. Same thing happens with hydrogen. Most hydrogen in uh, the natural environment, for example, in water, right, these hydrogen atoms here, 99.984% is uh, this light hydrogen, which has uh, just one proton as nu nucleus and no neutrons. But every once in a while, one in every 6,420 atoms, not that you need to memorize that, but every once in a while, there's a hydrogen atom in water that has uh, an extra neutron in its nucleus. And that's the source of heavy water. And we can use these... Uh, uh, isotopes to measure temperatures going back, in this case, this, this is the hockey stick curve I showed you earlier, going back a thousand years, but we can actually go back hundreds of thousands of years using um, the changes in the abundance of these isotopes. You might wonder, how does that work? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about isotopic global temperature measurement. So as you can imagine, those four isotopes, so we have a light hydrogen and a heavy hydrogen, and we have a light oxygen and a heavy oxygen, they combine to form water, sort of randomly. And uh, every once in a while, I, instead of writing this as H2O, I've written it as HHO, and every once in a while, uh, you know, every 6,000 oxygen atom or water molecules, you get one of these uh, hydrogen atoms that's uh, a heavy hydrogen. And every once in a while, you know, H2O forms with, and the oxygen that's here happens to be a heavy oxygen. And so it turns out that water, those molecules that have either heavy oxygen or heavy hydrogen, this heavy hydrogen H2 is called deuterium. I, I'll try to avoid using that term if I can. Could you? might be a little confusing, but so that I sometimes might refer to this as deuterium, and this is just an extra heavy oxygen. Every once in a while, the oxygen, the water that contains those heavy, those heavy atoms is a little, of course, that makes the water a little bit heavier. And that heavy water evaporates just a little less readily. It's it's a little less volatile. So he, if you had a, a glass of that heavy water, it would take a lot, a lot longer to evaporate. And that's the key. Since water with, and I'm, for now I'm just going to switch to uh, talking about uh, oxygen, but water, the opposite is true too, that water with light uh, uh, oxygen, so with O16, which is by far more abundant, it evaporates more readily. So if you look at rain and snow, rain and snow have slightly higher concentrations of O16 than O18 because O16 water with O16 evaporates uh, more readily. And so what happens is as the Earth's temperature decrease, as it decreases, so over long geological time periods, as the Earth temperature decreases and we store ice on land, remember here that 20,000 years ago, I mentioned that Toronto was under a sheet of ice. It was called the Laurentian ice sheet. 20,000 years ago, we were in an ice age. There was a mile of ice right where you're sitting right now. There was a mile of ice over your head. And that's a lot of water to store on land. And that water came from precipitation. And that precipitation was heavy in oxygen 16. So as the Earth's temperature decrease, 
decreases and we get these ice sheets stored on land, O16 is selectively removed from the oceans because of the hydrological cycle, because of rain and snow. And so if we're removing O16 from the oceans, then the ratio of O18 to O16, the heavy, the heavy component will tend to remain and the O18 to O16 ratio increases as the Earth's temperature goes down. I hope that's clear. If that's confusing, I suggest you maybe go back and uh, you know try to listen to that explanation again because that's important. So, rain contains more O8, O16 than O18, and so that when when it snows and rains in cold periods and you get ice stored on land, it's removing O16 from the oceans. So the o ocean's concentrations of O18 indicates uh, the volume of ice that's been stored on land and hence the mean global temperature. It's not a direct measurement, it's what we call a proxy. So how do we know the O18 concentrations in the ocean going back uh, you know, thousands and thousands of years. Well, it turns out that marine organisms, snails, clams, anything that builds their shell uh, makes calcium carbonate. Notice that calcium carbonate here has an oxygen atom in it. So at the time that that, that, that snail or shell lived, it would be storing uh, oxygen in its shell in the form of calcium carbonate and we can measure the amount of oxygen 18 in its shell and uh, determine the concentration of oxygen 18 at the time that it died. Of course, these snails and shells die and they get laid down on the ocean floor and we can drill the ocean floor and get a, get a core of marine sediments as I've shown here and we can analyze each layer to get the amount of oxygen 18 in it. And that will tell you uh, what the temperature was at the time the animals that lived that laid down that sediment uh, going back thousands and thousands of years. So what we measure actually is the oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 ratio. And remember, as you store ice on land, you're removing oxygen 16, so the ratio of uh, O18 to O16 is going to go up. So they basically take the sample minus some reference divided by the reference, and here they've multiplied it by a thousand. So instead of taking a percent, they multiply it by a thousand, and that's called per mil. So this ratio, the change in this oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 ratio, acts like a thermometer. It's a proxy for the global temperature. We call it uh, here delta O18. You'd read that instead of you'd read that as the per mil of oxygen O18. The per mil of oxygen O18 raises by about 0.7 for every degree uh, that the temperature drops. And so we can take those cores and we can uh, date the layers going down in the cores the, of uh, sea sediments, and we can get a plot like this. This is the uh, delta O18. So this is the oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 ratio. Notice that the axis has been flipped. It's negative up here and positive here. And the reason it's flipped is so that this is a proxy for temperature, because remember, as temperature goes up, delta O18 goes down, and as temperature goes down, Delta O18 goes up. So that's why this axis is in the non-traditional way. So this is the concentration of you've like of oxygen 18 in the sediments. This is present day, and then this is going back in time. Kilo years BP means thousands of years before present. So this over here is 800,000 years before the present time. So and with this being present day. And so we have the this proxy for global temperature going back 800,000 years. Now, I mentioned to you that that change in the per mil of delta O18 was about 0.7 per degree. And you can see that's about 0.22. That's about three plus or minus three degrees Celsius uh, in this. And 
as I mentioned, this axis has been flipped so that you can actually read this as, as these are higher temperatures than these. So notice that the concentration of O18 increases during an ice age. It increases because O16 has been selectively removed from the oceans uh, by precipitation, by rain and snow. And so increasing on this graph is going downwards for O18. And you can so, so you can see here there are peaks. There are actually valleys in this graph where concentration of O18 is a maximum. These are ice ages. And I mentioned to you that about uh, 20,000 years ago, so that would be this one, about 20,000 years ago right here, we were under a mile of ice. And you can see the, the peaks here are interglacial periods where you don't have ice coverage. And then about every 100,000 years, if you look at the spacing here, that's about 100,000 years. About every 100,000 years, uh, you get an ice age. We'll talk about what, where those come from, what's the natural cause of those ice ages in a moment. The key point to remember is that uh, we have an ice age about every 100,000 years. You can see we've had one, two, three, four, five. And Homo sapiens have been around for a couple hundred thousand years, modern Homo sapiens, so they've experienced uh, these ice ages. You can do the same thing with ice cores. Of course, in sea sediment cores, you use calcium carbonate, that use the oxygen in calcium carbonate. But in, in uh, cores of ice here, you can use the, the hydrogen in the water. And there has been, in the same way that you can drill a core into the sea sediments, uh, which eventually turn into stone, you can drill into the ice sheet in Antarctica. And there's been a core drilled 3.6 kilometers deep into Vostok, Antarctica. <coughs> Sorry. The advantage of that particular analysis is not only can you get the uh, heavy hydrogen concentration, which gives you the temperature, uh, you can also, there's little bits of air trapped in that snow, and so you can get the, the corresponding CO2 concentration as well as the temperature. Let me show you those results. So these are the comparable results, but taken from ice, tor ice cores. So again, isotopic measurements, this time using heavy hydrogen, which is called deuterium. And uh, uh, this is the, the temperature. So the, the black line here is the temperature. This is a slightly different graph. It's a graph taken from your book, figure 9.2. Here's present day, and then this is going back in time uh, over 400,000 years. And the solid curve here is the temperature, uh, as determined from the heavy hydrogen concentration. And the dashed line here is the CO2 concentration in the little air bubbles trapped in the snow, uh, which were, uh, of course, extracted from, from, from the ice cores. And you can see they're highly correlated. And it tells pretty much the same story with... Uh, uh, this is an interglacial period, and then these are ice ages in here. So an ice age about every 100,000 years. So we have sort of two independent measurements. Of course, there's substantial error bars on those measurements, but we have two independent measurements uh, verifying these ancient. In fact, there's more, there's more ways to do it than, than ice and sea cores. So we have actually more than that. And so it shows the same result, that the Earth has gone into and emerged from several ice ages. And in this case, you can see you've got a temperature change of around plus or minus 5 degrees C. The key takeaway is that really small temperature differences can have huge consequences for climate. The difference between the present climate and an ice age is only uh, you know 2 or 3 degrees C of global temperature decrease. So um, you know people think that... Uh, you know, one or two degrees doesn't sound like very much in terms of uh, climate change, but it's actually quite enormous uh, when you think of these these kinds of impacts. So let's now go to the uh, get to the issue of what caused these prehistoric temperature changes. I mentioned this in lecture, so some of you already know. Uh, it's actually orbital variations. They're called Milankovitch oscillations after a uh, scientist in the uh, 1800s, who first proposed this. The dominant effect is uh, the changes in the Earth's orbit from uh, round 
to elliptical. It's called eccentricity, which and it has a period of every uh, 100,000 years. So we go from round to elliptical back to round every 100,000 years. And that is the primary driver of uh, climate change. That changes... Uh, these orbital variations change the amount and distribution of sunlight striking the Earth. There's also uh, changes in the tilt. The, the Earth wobbles a little bit. The tilt angle here changes between 21.5 to 24.5 degrees. It's called obliquity. That has a period or a cycle of, of 41,000 years. And just like a top, if you've played with a top as a child, uh, not only does the axis wobble, but it also precesses. It goes in a circle. So the earth, uh, the tilt of the earth uh, toward the sun will reverse every, uh, and come back to where it was every 23,000 years. And these three orbital variations uh, influence the amount and distribution of sunlight and drive the climate, small changes in the climate that were enough to uh, cause the ice ages. The dominant effect is this uh, eccentricity, which has a period of 100,000 years that I mentioned, and that's caused by why Why does the Earth go from round to circular? Well, it's the slight tug of the gas giants in our solar system. So uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune, and to some extent Uranus, they're, they're large planets. They, they tug on uh, the Earth and, and change the eccentricity. So we have a pretty good understanding in an astrophysical sense, of what caused prehistoric climate change. So now that we've talked about what caused ancient climate change and the comings and goings of the ice ages, next we can talk about uh, a topic called radiative forcing, uh, which is, of course, a human-caused thing. So radiative forcing is the imbalance in the heat flow uh, at the top of the troposphere, so at the top of the sort of the atmosphere where our weather happens, caused by human effects. And there's various effects, not just greenhouse gases, although that is the dominant one. So for the temperature to be stable, as it says here, for the temperature to be stable, the amount of energy coming in and being absorbed from the sun has got to equal the amount of energy that the Earth radiates back out to space. And as we discussed in the introduction to this presentation, that humans are adding greenhouse gases that are disturbing this energy balance. Uh, we have more energy coming in from the sun, at least instantaneously, than uh, radiation going out because we're adding CO2 and methane, particularly that's decreasing the amount that the planet can radiate to space for a given uh, surface temperature. That's the basic physics that we talked about earlier. And the difference between these two heat flows, so energy coming in and being absorbed and radiating, that difference, the absorbed minus the uh, radiated, we call radiative forcing. And it could be caused by, for example, greenhouse gas emissions. Although you'll see as we go on in this talk, there's a number of other physical causes that can cause a change in that energy balance. So radiative forcing is the change in the energy balance uh, of the Earth uh, caused by various effects. And it has units of watts per meter squared. We talked about what a watt is. It's an energy flow per unit time per square area per meter squared of, of planet Earth. So here's the textbook definition. Radiative forcing is the temporary imbalance in heat flow, which climate will correct for over time by changing temperature. And positive radiative forcing is uh, where you've got more energy coming in than going out, and that's going to cause warming. And similarly, something called negative radiative forcing is where you, have, you make a change to the planet that uh, causes more energy to leave by radiation than's coming in from the sun. And that would cause cooling. This table here shows the main contributions of uh, anthropogenic, so human-caused radiative forcing since pre-industrial times, so since 1750 to present. This is from the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. So there's sort of three different categories. The, the 
direct effect of greenhouse gases is the one that everybody knows about. And we talked about this, that carbon dioxide and methane, so CO2 and CH4, are the dominant greenhouse gases. And currently here, look at this number, 1.68. What And that's watts per meter squared. So what that is telling you is that when you increase the CO2 concentration from pre-industrial levels, which was 278 parts per million to 405 parts per million, we're now up to about 214. So when you add that much CO2 to the atmosphere, it causes a temporary imbalance of more energy coming in from the sun than going out by about 1.6 eight watts per meter squared similar effect for methane and then there's something called halocarbons we're going to talk about these later there are the refrigerants mainly cfcs though there are others and something called nitrous oxide that's different than nox it's uh we'll talk about it it's also causes a radiative forcing so this is by far the dominant effect and the effect that we understand well there are other effects called indirect greenhouse effects. Now here, this is the stratospheric ozone, and this is perhaps where some of the confusion lies. Stratospheric ozone, O3, is a greenhouse gas. That means that O3 ozone absorbs infrared radiation. But what has happened to a stratospheric ozone since pre-industrial times? Has stratospheric ozone gone down, or has stratospheric ozone gone up? Well, you should know, even before watching the presentation that's part of this course, that the ozone layer is in trouble and uh, the ozone concentration has gone down. So we've lost that greenhouse gas. And so the radiative forcing is negative. It's actually causing cooling of the planet. There's also tropospheric ozone. Remember that. That's air pollution. That's the stuff that we talked about in the air pollution part of the course that's produced by knocks from your car with uh, volatile organic compounds combined with UV in the summertime undergoes a photochemical reaction to create ozone. And that's at ground level. So that's tropospheric ozone. We live in the troposphere. What's happened to tropospheric ozone since 1750? Well, in 1750, the air would have been nice and pristine. There wouldn't have been any uh, human-caused ozone, or almost none. But uh, so from 1850 to present, tropospheric ozone has gone up. And so the ozone in the troposphere, ground-level ozone, is causing, uh, absorbs infrared radiation and is causing uh, positive radiative forcing. It's causing uh, global warming. There's other effects. I'm going to talk about these direct aerosols. I mentioned this in the air pollution part of the course, that when we put up sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere from a coal-fired plant, some of that sulfur dioxide bonds with other atoms in the air and forms sulfate particles. It turns out sulfate particles are reflective, and that can provide some cooling. That's part of the effect. I'll discuss it more later, but that's why we have a negative number here. that It makes the atmosphere look more, look more shiny and reflect sunlight, which cools the planet. Indirect aerosols, I'll talk about that in a moment. Aerosols provide sites for clouds to form, and clouds are generally puffy and reflect sunlight. We have greatly changed the albedo, the reflectiveness of the planet, due to cutting down trees and putting up cities. And we've it seems like we've made the planet more reflective. That's cooling. And there's been some change in the solar output since uh, 1750. We, we can determine this by measurements and uh, by astrophysics, and so that's a slight positive effect. And there's some of the natural effects, that are non-anthropogenic effects, that I think one of the students asked about. It's pretty small. Look at how small solar variations are relative to, these are all human inputs. Now, before I leave this slide, I really, really want to emphasize that the ozone layer is not the cause of climate change. So look at stratospheric ozone here. It's Stratospheric ozone's gone down in the last 150 to 200 years. So it's actually causing a cooling effect. And when the ozone layer recovers, we will get a little bit of extra uh, global warming. But please correct that misconception. The ozone layer is not, the stratospheric ozone layer is not the uh, anything really to do with climate change. If anything, it's causing a slight cooling. I hesitate to mention that. Uh, it's kind of a finer point, but uh, 
quite interesting, I think. So what we're going to do next is go through each one of these sort of main categories and talk about them in uh, more detail. So let's start with, I think the first one here on the list is carbon dioxide. Yes, here we go. So I'm going to do an overview of the greenhouse gases. So carbon dioxide, of course, is a carbon atom and uh, two oxygen atoms. Uh, they're bonded in a line like this. The present concentration, I just looked it up the other day. It's around 414 parts per million. This is a graph of carbon dioxide over the last thousand years. We have some measurements in the last hundred or so years, but this goes back. This is taken from ice cores, uh, the little air bubbles in ice cores. And you can see where we're at 414 now. We're about 48% higher than what would be considered pre-industrial levels. So, uh, and we're higher in CO2 than we have been in about 20 million years. The main sources of CO2 emissions, as we talked about at the very beginning of this uh, section, is from combustion of fossil fuels. So 81% of it comes from combustions, burning of fossil fuels, energy. Some of it comes from deforestation. And it turns out the, the industrial process of making cement emits quite a bit of uh, CO2 as well. These are some recent measurements from NOAA. Uh, and uh, so this is a graph of the parts per million from 2013 to 2018. Uh, NOAA is the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, so this is a reliable source. The measurements are actually made on uh, Mauna Loa on a top of a volcano in Hawaii, uh, well away from... Uh, any contamination from industrial sources and cars and things like that. The interesting thing about this graph is you can see this fluctuating curve. This is the instantaneous, more or less, uh, CO2 concentration, and it varies once per year over a cycle. And this is referred to uh, in the literature as the breathing earth or the Keeling curve after uh, American chemist Charles Keeling, who first uh, developed the technique and started making these measurements on Mauna Loa. What happens is in the summertime, uh, the no this is in the Northern Hemisphere, there's not a lot of mixing between the no Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. So in the Northern Hemisphere in the summertime, the trees take on leaves, we have plants growing. So through photosynthesis, carbon is captured into plants and we lose a little bit of CO2. And then in the wintertime, when the plants die and the leaves fall, that carbon is returned back to the atmosphere. So this is the annual cycle of the carbon cycle of the uh, vegetation growing and then, and then dying in the, in the wintertime and giving back some of its CO2. That's called the breathing earth or the, the, uh, the Keeling curve. And if you average that, uh, so this is a uh, an annual moving average. You can see that the, the net effect is going up. So the, the cyclic variations are natural, but this, this constant march up of about 2.6 parts per million is totally not natural, and it's because of human emissions of CO2 into the atmosphere. Turns out CO2 has an enormous lifespan, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years uh, uh, before it uh, is lost from the atmosphere. Some of it's absorbed into the sea, um, and there are other paths for, uh, uh, but it has a very, very long at, uh, atmospheric lifetime. Here's a more zoomed out view. These are, this is, I don't want to say full, but nearly the full uh, CO2 measurement record from Mauna Loa starting in 58 by Charles Keeling. You can see the slope is upwards. You can see that the, so this is parts per million, uh, versus year starting back in 1958. And you can see the beautiful red Keeling curve with the oscillations and our uh, moving average moving up. And you can see the problem is not only is the slope increasing, but the curvature, it's bending in the wrong direction. So not only are we putting out uh, CO2 concentrations, we're putting them out at a greater rate. We haven't seen any uh, uh, sign of this turning around anytime soon. The next greenhouse gas is methane. We talked about this. Methane is 
the primary component of natural gas, but it's also produced by when uh, anything rots in an anaerobic environment, when it rots uh, due to bacteria in an environment where there isn't much oxygen. And so we get uh, methane emissions from things like rice paddies and landfills. The total emissions of uh, methane represent about 30% of the uh, greenhouse gas rated enforcing. Remember that chart I showed you with all the greenhouse gases? Uh, so it's about 30% of the problem. Turns out methane has a fairly short atmospheric lifetime, so it's probably not as big an issue. If we could stop emitting methane, uh, it would quickly you know, in a matter of a few decades, disappear from the atmosphere, unlike CO2. So CO2 is a much bigger issue. But nevertheless, it's still a significant amount of, uh, of radiative forcing. We have emissions from fossil fuels. These would be leaks from uh, gas wells, leaks from, of uh, methane from fracking of uh, oil and gas, things like that. A lot of it comes from the food industry. Enteric fermentation here is the emissions from uh, ruminants, from animals that chew their cud. Uh, so burps, primarily methane burps from uh, cattle and sheep and things like that. Uh, you can see other things, animal waste, domestic sewage, landfill, burning of biomass, and rice paddies. So some of these have to do with the, sort of the rotting of uh, material in an anaerobic environment. Food production, if you add them up, is a pretty significant for source. So all of this is anthropogenic. This is a graph here taken from your book, figure 9.4. It's the atmospheric concentration over time. So uh, going back a thousand years, there was some methane in the atmosphere, of course, because some methane is, is uh, natural, biogenic. Uh, and you can see it taking off in the industrial time. So we're about two times or a little more than two times pre-industrial concentrations. The concerning things about methane, I mean, it has a short atmosphere, atmospheric lifetime, but it has a large global warming potential. And global warming potential is sort of how strong the gas is in terms of absorbing uh, infrared radiation relative to CO2. And it's about 20 to 50 times worse than CO2. So if you emit a kilogram of methane, it's equivalent to emitting about 20 to 50 kilograms of CO2 in terms of the amount of warming it provides. And the lower graph here is just a more zoomed in one because this it's kind of the last thousand years, and then this is recent times, 80 to almost present. You can see uh, methane going up. Notice around 2009, here we have a kind of a plateauing of methane emissions. So this would be uh, the financial collapse. Uh, it's interesting that I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see another plateau because of what we're experiencing right now with the uh, decrease in um, economic activity, which is generally a very positive thing for the natural environment, as you've learned in the uh, earlier parts of this course. Another greenhouse gas is something called nitrous oxide, N2O. So this is two uh, nitrogen atoms bonded to an oxygen atom. It occurs naturally. It accounts for about 6% of the radiative forcing. Human emissions come mainly from fertilizers and agriculture when you clear land like is being done in a big way in brazil the land produces uh, nitrous oxide for quite a while for several years i think after the land has been cleared it has a really strong uh, effect it's a strong ghg it's about 170 280 times stronger than uh, co2 and here's a graph i got just very recently from uh, noah so this was i got this just the other day showing uh the climb from 1975 to present of uh, N2O. So this is a, a concern. It's not a huge concern, not as much as CO2, but still, it's still a greenhouse gas, meaning that it absorbs infrared radiation. Another source of greenhouse gases are so-called halocarbons. Halocarbons are carbon-based molecules that contain fluorine, chlorine, and bromine. And I've Got a little sketch over here of a CFC 11 that's, uh, that's free on 11. Uh, it's not naturally occurring. These emissions are entirely man made by companies like DuPont that invented, their, uh, invented them. They're mostly used as refrigerants, though 
CFC 11 has been banned. And so it's a, it's, it's a man-made molecule here, but they're incredibly potent, uh, greenhouse gases. They absorb infrared radiation thousands of times more in some cases. Uh, down here, we have a chart of the different chlorofluorocarbons. So this is CFC 11. That's free on 11. That's free on 12. And their global warming potentials, you can see, are uh, thousands of times stronger than uh, uh, CO2. So if you emit one kilogram of when you like if you throw your old refrigerator out and you emit one kilogram of CFC 12, that's like emitting uh, 4,200 kilograms of CO2 in terms of warming up the planet. They also destroy the ozone layer. That's a separate issue. This is ozone depletion potential relative to uh, CFC 11. So they, these chemicals also just in some cases destroy the ozone layer. That's a separate presentation and a separate issue that has to do with protecting the biosphere from uh, ultraviolet radiation. That's a presentation that's coming uh, immediately after this presentation uh, on climate change. So don't get those, don't get these issues mixed up in your head. The good news is that halocarbons, these refrigerants, these ones that are dangerous for the ozone layer, are decreasing worldwide. CFC 11 and CFC 12, these chlorofluorocarbons have been banned. And so in theory, the worldwide emissions are supposed to be zero. There might be some cheating going on particularly in China, we hear, but they were banned by the Montreal Protocol and subsequent uh, amendments to that protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. So please watch the next presentation to hear about uh, uh, stratospheric ozone uh, depletion. But this is the mean concentration of CFC-12 uh, over time. You can see they were being made for refrigerants, refrigerants, and then there was a ban and we've seen them uh, decay in the atmosphere. And so that's really, really good news for our stratospheric ozone layer, uh, almost unrelated to climate change, other than the fact that these uh, the emissions of these gases are in themselves uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Particulate matter also plays a role in climate change. And there's three ways it happens. I talked about particulate matter. Remember PM 2.5? Well, this is really about all PM. So I talked about particulate matter in the air pollution part of the course. Uh, Human-made aerosols affects the Earth's energy balance. Remember the incoming minus the outcoming is radiative forcing in uh, three ways. Uh, one is that the particles, uh, some of the uh, air pollution produces sulfate particles, which are reflective. They make the Earth look shinier from space. That has a cooling effect since less of the solar radiation is absorbed. They also provide, it's a fancy name, nucleation sites. They provide sites where droplets of water can form and, and they promote cloud formation. I'll show you a cool example of that, a natural example of that in a minute. And those clouds, those puffy clouds, uh, make the Earth look more reflective from space and they reflect sunlight. So they tend to be cooling. They tend to have a negative radiative forcing. And then the carbonaceous soot, the black soot that comes out of like trucks and diesel engines and, and uh, other combustion cycles, they, uh, they are, it's black and it absorbs sunlight, so it has a warming effect. So you can see direct reflection from sulfate particles is negative forcing of radiative forcing of minus 0.4 watts per meter squared. The indirect reflection is this for cloud formation. I'll talk more about that in a moment. It's thought, there's a great uncertainty here that's thought to be causing cooling of about 0 to 1.5 watts per meter squared. And then you know, putting black soot into the into the atmosphere yeah, absorbs sunlight, and, and so it uh, warms the planet slightly. The key point here is that aerosols from air pollution uh, are have a big effect. Uh, oh, excuse me, I've got a typo there. The typographical error. Uh, the uh, they're offsetting about half of the direct radiative forcing. So if we clean up our air pollution act, we're actually going to uh, we it could actually temporarily exacerbate or make uh, climate change a little bit worse, which is a bit odd. We still want to have clean air, of course. So here's a, a natural example of uh, 
the what's called the indirect aerosol effect. And I noticed this. This is uh, from 2018 when uh, a volcano erupted on uh, the Big Island of Hawaii. And you can see here the fissure with the... Uh, uh, this is a shot from a satellite from space. And you can see the smoke coming out of this fissure. And of course, it disturbed homes in this region terribly. It was not good news for the people living in that area. But what we're seeing here is the smoke coming out of this uh, volcanic fissure. It drifts down downstream. And of course, uh, Hawaii is a very hot, humid place. And uh, it those little smoke particles provided sites for droplets to condense. And you get this cloud plume. Well, this... Of course, this is natural. It's a, it's not a, a man-made effect. But the same thing happens when a, a ship puts out smoke from a smokestack or a factory puts out smoke. It puts out smoke. That smoke creates clouds. And you can imagine that those clouds are white and they reflect sunlight. So they actually have a slight cooling effect on the planet. They uh, reflect sunlight and they, they offset uh, climate change. So that's what I mean by the indirect aerosol effect. So keep in mind, there's a lot of interesting things going on. There's Everybody knows about greenhouse gases, uh, but there's also these indirect uh, and direct aerosol effects that are quite interesting in themselves. This is a final summary table taken from uh, IPCC. This is a bit old, but it's a nice simple one. So what I want to do is just go through this. So this is... They're using RF for radiative forcing. We're using the term delta Q. So that's the energy coming in minus the energy going out. More coming in than going out means you're warming. More going out than coming in means you're cooling. And this line down here is the zero radiative forcing. And what they're showing is this is the radiative forcing due to carbon dioxide. That's that uh, you know, 1.6, 1.7 watts per meter squared. And that's the uncertainty value because we know that the uh, concentration has gone from about 200 parts per million to 400 and something parts per million today. Uh, so these are long-lived uh, greenhouse gases. There's methane, uh, nitrous oxide, and the halocarbons. They're all producing positive radio forcing. Those are our refrigerants. Then we talked about ozone, while well, stratospheric ozone is decreased since pre-industrial times because of uh, the ozone destruction properties of refrigerants, and tropospheric ozone has gone up. Why? You should know this. Tropospheric ozone has gone up because of air pollution, right? It's that photochemical reactions, and so that's a positive forcing. This is one I didn't talk about. It turns out that when methane drifts up into the stratosphere, it, it forms water vapor, and there's not much water vapor in the in the stratosphere, and so it has a small positive effect. We have uh, sort of geoengineered the planet a little bit. We've we've uh, done some changing of the planet by cutting down trees and building cities. We've made the planet more reflective. Carbon black on snow from our factories has made the the land more uh, absorbing, and so there's a negative part and a positive part. Albedo is just reflectivity; it's the fraction of the sunlight that reflects from the planet. I talked about aerosol effects. Direct aerosol effects are things like sulfates uh, that are shiny and make the planet uh, more reflective. That's thought to be negative. Look at the big error bar there, though. And then uh, this cloud albedo effect. When we put smoke out from chimneys and cars, we uh, provide little tiny spots for clouds to, nu to nucleate on, just like that volcano I showed you. And it, the, the uh, Earth becomes more reflective, big error bar on that, but it's thought to be a negative radiative forcing. It's going to the left of the zero line. Con contrails, these are concentration uh, or condensation trails from jets. If you look up and you see a jet go over, you see it leaves a condensation trail. Surprisingly, I won't go into the details, that's thought to be slightly positive. And then there's been some changes in solar output since uh, pre-industrial times, since 1750. And when you add all these up, uh, although the error bar is big, uh, the fifth assessment report from the IPCC asserts with a high degree of confidence, something like 90-95% confidence, that the net effect of all these human activities has been uh, positive radiative forcing. So that's a nice summary of all the different effects. People generally only think about greenhouse gases, but there are many other things at play, and I think it's important that you have some idea about those. And so I find that's a, 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 this particular table or 
is a really nice summary of uh, most of the effects. There are actually other effects as well, but these are the dominant effects for climate change. And that ends uh, part two.